Every day we are bombarded with a load of stimulation coming from a whole variety of different sources and it's our senses that help us to perceive and interpret them. But what happens if our senses get a little bit confused? My name is Christian Flutter. Let's talk about sensory processing disorder. So we know about the main senses, right? We have five of them. You've got your touch, your taste, smell, sight, and seeing. But what if I told you we actually had two additional senses as well? We have proprioception, which is your body's ability to sense whereabouts it is in space without even having to look at it, and our vestibular system, which is kind of tied in with our balance centers. And these come from centers in our inner ears here, which help to orient our head in space when we can't particularly see what's going on inside it. So, all of these senses, what is their purpose? What is the role of our senses? Well, the senses help us to adapt and meet the demands of our environment. So anything that's going on around us, we can change and adapt and react according to what's going on around us. But then what is going on with sensory processing disorder? Well, think of it in a sense of the senses are coming in but we can't properly manage or understand what or interpret, that's a better word, interpret those sensory inputs. Think about it this way. You get a new jacket or a new jumper or a shirt, something along those lines, and it's got a hard tag at the back of it. You know, you put your shirt on, you kind of go, oh, that tag's a bit itchy. See, in most situations, in most individuals, when we put that jumper on, we go, oh, there's a tag there, and we can ignore that. We're aware of the sensory input. Our brain says, don't worry about it, and we move on. Now, in some individuals who may have a degree of sensory disorder or processing disorder, that tag starts to become an irritation. You're digging in against their back and they start to get really annoyed by it. And so we've got to chop that tag off and otherwise all hell will break loose. Now, this may be an example of a tactile over-responsive response, if that makes sense. So, for each of those seven senses that we talked about, we could actually have different responses based on which kind of disorder we may have going on. See, we could be overreactive, we could be underreactive, we could have a discrimination issue, or we could even be craving particularly sense, particular sensory inputs. So let's go through a few of these ones for you. First up, let's talk about the overreactive. So in kids who are overreactors or find that they overrespond to particular sensory inputs, these are the kids where an input is just too much for them to handle. So they tend to avoid that particular situation. They might, they might avoid the bright lights. They might cover their ears in loud situations. They don't like going on the swings. They can't sit still. And these are the kids that Oh, it tastes too textury for that particular food because the sensory input from it is just too much. But on the other end of that spectrum, we can also have the under-responsive kid. So the under-responsive or the under-reactive kid is the one that does not properly perceive the sensory information coming in. So where the overreactive felt it and responded too greatly to it, the under-reactive, it's the other end of that spectrum. They do not perceive it as clearly. So these are the kids who can't feel where their body is in space. They're the ones that are constantly slouching or very, very floppy kind of a posture. They're tripping over things. They might need a lot of flavor added to their food. They like their music loud and fun or they might be coming in to get some of the biggest, tightest hugs that they've ever perceived. These guys are the ones that need that sensory information coming in dialed up to 11 to be able to perceive it properly. Now, the other end of this one, no, that's not the other end of this one. Now, the next one is gonna be talking about those who need that sensory information. They're actively seeking it out. And these ones are known as the sensory seeking or craving behavior types. Now, in a kid who is sensory seeking or craving, they are actually seeking out a sensory input to make up for an apparent insufficiency in that sensory input coming in. So this might be the kid who is constantly touching or stroking a surface. They're coming up to you. They're always trying to get hugs. They're very, very clingy. They're constantly looking for sources of stimulation to help satisfy that apparent under stimulation that they are receiving. So these guys, it's almost like they're not quite over or under. They're just not getting enough of it. And the last type is the discriminatory type. 
Now the discriminatory type, it's almost like when there is a sensory input coming in, they have a hard time interpreting that particular input. Now it doesn't mean that they have a hard time differentiating between sounds and sights, but it's almost like the kids who have a hard time recognizing the difference between the letter D and the letter B, they look very similar, however they are kind of mirror images of one another. Now we also might find that they might misinterpret what they're hearing. So instead of saying the word thing, they'll think they said the word think, and it sounds very similar. So it can be difficult to discriminate between the two different types of information coming in. So then what actually brings about this confusion in sensory processing in the first place? I mean, surely as our senses develop, they shouldn't get confused, right? Well, I have two suggestions that may be contributing to what we're seeing with sensory processing disorder. And keep in mind that there are many reasons as to why a child may develop sensory processing disorder. These are just a couple that I like playing around with. The first one is actually looking at normal sequence of sensory development. What happens if we start disrupting that development? We take our newborn infant out to the shops, or we plonk them in front of a TV, or we have a screen going on around them. We put them in highly brightly lit rooms. Uh, that may then disrupt that auditory processing development and start the visual development at a time when the visual development is not quite ready for it and the auditory is not quite finished. So this could then create a bit of a disruption at where we are at. Now, if we do this with any of the stages of sensory development, we may then lead to a disruption of normal progression. And a disruption to normal progression could lead to confusion and eventually what we see manifest as sensory processing disorder. And the second part is to do with where the sensory information coming up into our brain gets interpreted. See, inside our brain, we have a region that's called the somatosensory cortex. And this area is where a lot of that sensory information comes in and our body interprets it and responds to it in a necessary manner. Now, if we have a bit of a disruption up at that point, it can then lead to a confusion of that sensory input as well. And this is actually where manual therapy may play a role in helping with sensory processing disorder management. See, there is research out there that demonstrates that correction of spinal dysfunction in the neck especially will help to improve our sensory integration at that point inside our brain. So this then suggests to us, if we're having some difficulties with sensory processing, and especially if you're seeing some difficulty with like balance or that proprioceptive they're constantly slouching, this could be something worth addressing with your healthcare practitioner, healthcare professional, have a chat with them and see if getting some manual therapy, that done by a chiropractor, an osteo or a physio, may help in the management of your sensory processing disorder. I hope that helps you. Speak to you again soon. Bye now.